Art Paul is legendary in the world of art and the world of ideas. Art established a visual culture in the magazine. He was the architect. I knew immediately I wanted him as my art director. Well, he was one of the first major art directors to use fine artists as illustrators. And illustrators as fine artists. Art Paul designed the best logo any magazine has ever had or ever will have. With his iconic symbol for Playboy, he hit a grand slam home run. He broke the barrier between commercial art and fine art. He could very easily call up Andy Warhol or Salvador Dali and invite them to contribute work. He used die cuts so that there would be parts of a picture peeking through a hole in one page. Nobody was doing stuff like this in magazines. He managed a trick on every cover, and that is, where's the bunny? They weren't just girly pictures. They were conceptual pieces. People were sending pictures of the logo from all over the world. Over the years, I've watched art's creative process, which is boundless. There are probably 400 heads. Every single one was unique, it was different, it was incredible. He obviously thinks a lot about the human psyche and the kind of masks that we put on in society. I think there's another piece of his legacy, which is his more personal work. That's a transition of art from a graphic designer doing world-class client work to becoming an artist. I am an artist. I have to be an artist. Welcome and good evening to the Chicago Public Library. We are pleased to invite and converse with Jen Ping and Susan Sneed. And our topic this evening is The Man Behind the Bunny, The Art of Playboy. And it is a documentary about Art Paul, um, a consummate artist, a Renaissance person, who um, introduced, I think, many, many people to the concept of art, art and commercial art, art as form, and continuing with his different backgrounds in music and writing and encouraging people. That is so um, needed in our times now to develop uh, a person's talent, to encourage a person's talent. And I think we would learn much from his example throughout his professional career. So without further ado, um, my take on uh, this film is amazing. It was um, over, overwhelming to me because I realized how little I knew and how much more I have to learn, not just about what Art Paul did as an artist, but his persona. So uh, I would welcome Jen Ping and uh, Suzanne C. And also, I would like to welcome our Director of Adult Services, Craig Davis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then we're going to just speak on a little general term, and then we're going to go into some um, questions that we have. And please feel free to add or, or uh, continue the conversation as you wish. We're, we're not just limited to what I have to say. Okay, and as far as the documentary here, um, how did this production come to fruition? What was the idea behind beginning uh, this production and why did you feature or your subject would be Art Paul? First of all, thank you for having us here. It's um, always been a pleasure um, coming back to the library event, even though this is the first time we do it virtually. And um, it's always a pleasure. Um, for the Art Paul film, actually, it's um, very interesting. Primarily, I'm a writer, and this is my directorial debut. I did work as an associate producer for Marlboro Child. That is a documentary film based on my book. But I met Susan more than 10 years ago 
at a literary event, and we were talking about Mulberry Child. And the next thing I know is Suzanne dropped off a bunch of Mulberry Tree branches at my apartment with berries, and it was just wonderful. So we have been friends ever since. It is through Suzanne that I get to know art, and I have always been impressed by him. You know, as you can see from the documentary film, and he was a legendary figure, and yet he was so humble, and he was so friendly, so unassuming. And I just felt art deserved to be better known. You know, he created the iconic rabbit logo, but. You know, we know the logo. You know, we don't think about the creator of the artwork. And so,、uh, when the Mulberry Child film was done, and I had a wonderful working relationship with my executive producer Alice Goodman, so we were talking about working again on another full film project. And so I thought, you know, Art Paul would be the perfect、uh, subject. That's how. This came into being,、um, but it took a joint effort to convince Art to do the film because Art is Art; he was forever humble. So Suzanne was very supportive, and、uh, you know, my late husband Francis, we had a couple dinners with Art together to convince him to do the film. And any new discoveries you made about Art Paul while filming this production? Either you, Jen, or Suzanne. Well, for me, I have quite a few actually new discoveries during the process of making the film. I constantly learn more about art、um, because when I walk in, I know、um, you know he was the founding art director of Playboy magazine. You know he played a significant role in the success of. The magazine in the fifties, sixties, and seventies, and he left Playboy in eighty、um, two. So the, the the creative part I know, but throughout the making of the film, I discovered you know he was a not only a prolific artist, he is also a wonderful. Susan called him a whimsical writer because he writes a lot of short notes. You know, it's very philosophical, very humorous, and also he mentored many artists, especially Chicago artists. You know, he mentored them. He paid them、um, prices to acquire the artwork versus just.、Um, Uh, license it for illustration. So in that way, he paid the artist full time to support them. So he did many different things. So continuously,、um, I have new discoveries about art. And also another moving part. You see the film. You probably have、uh, can see that that was not intentionally. It just came out organically. That was the loving relationship between art and Susan. And throughout working the film, that was. You know that part touched me so much, so it just come came out naturally in the film.、Uh, what a loving relationship they had. And Suzanne, anything you discovered while filming this、um, documentary about your husband? Not, not anything new, but I was one thing that surprised me was that well, he's always been very collaborative and cooperative, and、uh, you know, a lovely disposition. But how how cooperative he was, con considering all the difficulties he was having,、uh, the health problems,、um, really touched me. He he was patient、um, with the filming constantly. He、um, he was suffering increasingly from aphasia, where he couldn't find his words, and、uh, dementia. Although he was still himself and knew. You know what was wrong,、um, and worst of all, macular degeneration, where he could he could not see、mm -hmm. well, and that's very difficult for an artist. But he just kept on drawing, and、uh, so I was touched by that. That you know that that he was kind and and cooperative throughout, and it, it certainly wasn't from、um, pride in himself.、Uh, he just he liked. Jen and her husband, and he 
like uh, the the young man who was um, the uh, the cameraman for this very much. In fact, when um, when Art was very near his end, um, uh, Paul Chin um, uh, came and he was doing some special uh, f photos um, of Art's hands drawing and painting so that they could put um, the quotes by him up, you know, over that activity. And it kind of introduces each segment of the film, which is very poetic and beautifully done. So anyway, Paul um, uh, came and, and Art uh, drew and painted just so Paul could, you know, photograph his hand doing that. And I said, when Paul left, my goodness, you know, he's he's been drawing less and less, although to draw right up practically to your end is pretty remarkable. And and I said, but you, you know, you filming him caused him to draw this lovely uh, picture. And Paul said, oh, I'd be glad to come and pretend to be filming anytime for however long he <laughs> so he can draw and paint. <laughs> I didn't ask Paul to do that. But, uh, but that turned out to be Art's last drawing. And, and uh, Jen mentioned the mentoring. I think that's the one most remarkable thing about Art is that he probably mentored and commissioned more illustrators and artists, and artists as well as illustrators, than any art director in history of any magazine or newspaper in history. And, uh, and it was partly because he, he really believed in illustration. He didn't just stick a photograph in there like magazines do now. Um, and he believed in artists and he found them. He, he kept up on who was who and went to all the galleries and, you know, back to the images when Ed Paschke was still like a struggling beginner and uh, as an artist and, and you know, kept, kept Ed going. Our, uh, Ed Paschke said, I, I wouldn't have remained an artist if it hadn't been for arts backing, uh, which would have been a great loss to Chicago. Yes, and we, ha we do have some of Paschke's works here. Mm -hmm. So next time you're in the library, uh, please, uh, you know, either um, uh, ask at the, at the desk or go up to the second floor mezzanine and you will see some of his artwork uh, mm -hmm. on display. So these are oh, classic Chicago artists. It's 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 wonderful to to uh, see a progression of uh, local artists, like you said, and it encouraging because everything seems to be out of different cities, but here. But now mm -hmm. I think because of our Paul, we are definitely on the international map when it comes to art and innovation. So, yeah, and um, also the Chicago uh, the Chicago artists. Yes. Even when Art could uh, just say the word and Andy Warhol or Salvador Dali would do an illustration. Yeah. Uh, he still constantly used Chicago artists. Yeah, and that's wonderful. It's, 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 yeah. a, it's a tribute that uh, he felt that sure himself and sure of these artists mm -hmm. that uh, he was willing to take a chance with them because he recognized their talent. And sure enough, uh, that of himself to let artists sometimes just do what they would. He said, oh, just use your imagination. Let's see what you come up with. Let's see. If it wasn't right, you know, he'd tell them, but he'd let them just, you know, give them that freedom. Yes, and one of the pieces in the film uh, that uh, really touched me was when he was having difficulty seeing and you were walking with him and he wanted to go and find a pen and you wanted to help him. And he said, no, I can find it myself. <laughs> and for some people, they would have thought, oh, you know, he's, he, that, that was an awful thing. But for me, I felt like saying, no, it was his way of being very independent, which I think uh, mm -hmm. we saw that assuredness uh, throughout the filming. 
And you were great with it. You know, <laughs> you were really good with it. He yeah. never complained. It was extraordinary. All these things to struggle with and falls, you know, and all, but he never complained. He just dealt with it. Yes. And you know what? I, I can reflect in my life, and I'm sure you can, Jen, and yours, and, and Craig. There are people that we've been in touch with in our own personal lives that have shown us this type of example, too. Mm -hmm. And the humility, I think a lot of people don't, humility to some people means weakness, but to him, I, uh, while viewing the film, I saw it as one of his strengths, mm -hmm. his humility. Yes, and, and he put all, you know, his suffering and his thoughts about coming to terms with all these illnesses into his drawings. And when he finally let me sort his drawings, I was like sorting and I realized, oh, here's this category I didn't know existed where he's, you know, like confessing his fears and all to his sketchbook. And I collected them all together. And then after he passed, I, I put them together with his words to make a book that I hope, you know, will get published and be an inspiration to people who are dealing with illness. Because it's all like whimsy, it's even funny, death, illness, all these things, philosophical, whimsical. Oh, yeah. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. You know, yeah. anybody deal with these things, in, you know, from that point of view. Yeah, actually, it's quite amazing that uh, Art and Susan, they collected all these years of work. And I'm very lucky because Susan, you know, who is an uh, artist herself. So she put art's work, so many of them, all by category. And so when I come in, you know, she has already spent hours and hours with the intern's help to put them in category. So I was able to pull out and select the ones that I can feature in the film. And it's very moving if you see some of the presentations, even just the limited images I used in the film, you can see the change from his earlier days until the last phase of his time when he couldn't see clearly. And so the drawings become um, linear lines, but it's explosive, it's very expressive. Um, it's quite amazing. You and know, so it, art, you know, Susan always say art aged gracefully, and he certainly did. <laughs> yeah, that in part was his ID training in the Chicago Bauhaus, it was like, oh, play with your mistakes, which takes humility. And so when he, you know, when, and he had this assured line, I mean, he was just a master at drawing, but, and when macular degeneration was such a challenge, it made his lines shaky, made things, you know, scatter on the page. He said, oh, I think I'll just go with this. This is kind of interesting. <laughs> and so he did so, and he did it with all the skill that he had anyway, in, you know, in his mind. Um, and it turned out those were such wonderful drawings that I almost prefer them to the drawings where he was totally controlled and, you know, masterful. These, these kind of crazy, wild, uh, scattered drawings have this wonderful quality. I just treasure them. Wonderful. Again, I love the one about the quote about the eye, where uh, one of the people being interviewed talked about that, a particular drawing, that he still saw the eye behind, behind his uh, work and uh, he, he used it was a disability but in a, in a way it was such an opportunity for him because he was he was uh, trying another medium there mm -hmm. of uh, a person aging gracefully and still continuing with something he loved. Mm -hmm. Craig you you have some questions that I think are will be really piquing their interests and uh, let's let's go with you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll do my best. And uh, I have questions for both Suzanne and Zhang, individually or together. So um, this, I have a two-part question. And one of the issues you have mentioned, Suzanne, already. But the first is, the first part is, when did Art actually begin his journey at a, as an artist? And secondly, and I have to congratulate you, Jean and Suzanne, 
for mentioning the influence of Chicago's new Bauhaus on art and his career, because it's a very important artistic era that is little talked about anymore, except in close artistic circles. So how did art begin his journey? And secondly, how did Chicago's, his exposure to Chicago's new Bauhaus, how do you feel that it influenced his work at that time and later throughout his career? Well, I'll jump in to strike a few words and then Susan can give more details. <laughs> um, it's interesting when I was going through uh, art's art collection and one of the photos on his high school graduation is future career illustrator. <laughs> so, so art was saying since he was a child, he was inspired by his older brother who was an artist, but because he had to give up his artistic pursuit to make a living to support the family because uh, uh, the father died uh, when Art was only one year old. So he um, you know, determined to be an artist himself. His older brother also mentored him. Um, but then later on, Art entered Institute of Design, the Bauhaus that today is part of the uh, Institute of uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, so he learned, um, he was trained professionally in there. And so his philosophy of creation, one of the important ones is always the Bauhaus philosophy, less is more. And so that came through um, all his work. Uh, but I'm sure Susan can fill in more gaps in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, he got so much from the ID. Uh, and, and it was an inspiring place right out of the army when he was in the Air Corps. As soon as the war was over, he'd heard about this new place and he really wanted to go and uh, was so excited by it. And, and the, the big motto was form follows function, you know, very austere, like tons of white space. Well, Art was good at tons of white space and, and he could do, you know, minimal and all, but he never let himself be uh, cornered into just that. He, he was very, uh, he had a vivid imagination and loved strong, bold art. Um, and that was what I think Playboy was known for when he, you know, when he was the art director. And then uh, <laughs> other art directors that followed him respected him so much, they kind of kept up with that tradition. Um, and, uh, you know, the design, I think it was asked, someone asked about the design of the magazine. The design just kind of um, evolved from art's preferences and what he respected as art. It wasn't like studiously um, uh, minimal or anything like that, but, but it was always very clean and uh, and he wouldn't allow ads on the pages with the art and the, and, the, uh, and the copy. I mean, the editorial was separated from the, uh, from the um, uh, ads, which you almost never see, especially now. And uh, so, so it was, it was uh, very clear. It wasn't, like, there was this, uh, there was this fad for like being everything being scrambled. He never went for that. Everything always had to be, each page is almost like a poster, strong, bold, uh, uh, very deeply felt and expressive. That was, that was what the art was in Playboy and was known for. And uh, it's such a tragedy that all this work that as Jen said, um, they paid extra for so they could keep and have an art collection and then someday it would be given to um, a university as a record of the golden age of illustration in the in the 60s and the 70s and into the 80s that it, it didn't happen after all unfortunately but but if you can you know go back go to a library and look at all those old um, issues 
you see the, the strength of what he did. Suzanne, perhaps you could answer this. Maybe you, Hu Zheng, could chime in. This is a question I think, if we had art here, I'm sure that some, someone would ask, who were, who were his favorite artists, both classical and contemporary? <laughs> When he was uh, very young, he used to say um, uh, Michelangelo and, um, oh, the, the guy who did illustrations for Saturday, Saturday Evening Post, you know. Maxwell? Huh? Maxwell? No, they're, they're, they're really corny illustrations. Oh. Uh, oh, well. I know. Was you, it Lion Decker, was it? Was it? No, no, it wasn't. The other one. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was the one who was so famous on Saturday yeah. Evening Post. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, he he believed in high art and low art. You know, it was all art. And uh, Norman Rockwell. Norman Rockwell. Yes, exactly, yeah. Norman Rockwell. He, he actually met him on the street in New York, and he was so excited. And this is when art was already quite famous. He said, oh, you're Norman Rockwell. <laughs> I stopped him on the street. And Norman Rockwell said, yes. And he said, well, I'm Mark Paul, you know, I I'd love to have you illustrate something in Playboy. Oh, Rockwell was thrilled, but then his wife wouldn't let him. <laughs> <laughs> That's really something. How do you, how did, this is for both of you, how do you feel that arts work may have influenced the modern art movement of the past 75 years or so? Um, I think when, was, okay, go ahead. He was influenced by, he, he had his finger on the pulse. So when pop art came along, you know, he calls Andy Warhol, he in, invites pop artists to interpret the Playmate, which was <laughs> fun. And, uh, and you know, the Harry Who, the uh, Chicago Images, all these, all these groups. He, he saw them. He saw what they were doing. He was very open-minded. It wasn't like any one, one uh, style. It was, it was more. He loved it all, and he showcased it. Right. You know, when I was doing interviews with artists. Um, both artists that had the chance or art directors that worked with art, or the younger generation, they learned about his artwork. Um, I can see, you know, the influence in there, how he impact their work. And especially the young, you know, even Cards Against Humanities, they were looking at art as a pioneer, you know, saying back at his time, um, I think Steve Heather in the film was saying art was doing um, evolution in a catalog format. You know, it's not digital, but he was so advanced. He's doing, you know, so many things at his era. And the young people today, for those, unfortunately, you know, the popular, you know, the, the, the red population, the regular population, they don't know much about art. But for those who studied art and learned about his work uh, in art school, and they seem to be tremendously impressed by him and consider his work a revolution that is guiding them in their own revolution in today's digital world. That was very moving and inspiring for me to see. He was a huge father figure at Playboy, you know, everyone who worked for him and with him, uh, and a huge father figure in his field. He kind of, you know, young, young um, uh, designers and illustrators really idolized him and respected him, it was touching. And when he had retired and went back to the Playboy um, offices for some party. Oh, they were inaugurating a new, a new office space. And, and these young men who, um, who had worked for him, they were grabbing him to show him things. Like, come up and look at their new computer thing. You know, look at, oh, come in, you know, like, come over here, look at this. They were, and I thought, it's exactly like watching little boys at Christmas, you know, like, dad, come look, dad. What I got, what's in <laughs> And 
And yes, it was just really sweet. That's really a wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Suzanne. That is very sweet. Okay, looking looking back a little bit, how and, and Jang, you illustrate this very beautifully in your film. And but as a little precursor for those who have not yet seen the film, perhaps both of you can comment on how did Art come to Playboy to begin with? How did he launch his career there at Playboy? Well, I'll jump in and Susan can come back uh, uh, too. Uh, I think after um, he graduated from IT, um, uh, Institute of Design ID, uh, he was having his own studio, you know, doing commercial art. And I think Hugh Hefner uh, heard about him from a mutual friend and came to him thinking to ask him to be an illustrator. But when I was interviewing Hugh Hefner, he was saying when he met Art and look at the work in his studio and talk to him, he said he immediately know he was the art director he wanted to hire. And so eventually he persuaded Art to join him. I think he did the first few issues as a freelancer and, uh, and then later on become a full-time staff, but he and Hefner really started the magazine together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he he was very, uh, you know, leery at first, like, whoa, what kind of magazine is this? And and you want to call it what? At that point, he wanted to call it Stag Party. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but he was so impressed by Hefner's, like, mad enthusiasm and, and, and like, dedication. And also treated by the fact that this would be taking a chance on a whole new... Uh, kind of magazine, um, and taking a chance was appealing to him. I mean, he's very, he's very quiet, calm kind of person. But, but, but he did take chances when he was training in, you know, for World War II in these old uh, open cockpit planes. He hadn't got to the part where they tell you what to do if the if the power goes off, if if the propeller stops in in, in midair, and it did. And he, the propeller stopped, the plane was just, nothing was working. And he thought, well, I hate to jump out and waste a plane because that was, you know, important to keep the planes. He thought, what if I dive down really fast and the air will start the propeller moving? Just like on the ground, someone would have to start the propeller for you. So he tried it <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> Obviously. We're glad it did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and so you know, it just came down. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, Suzanne and Zheng, there were a couple of quotes that we pulled from the from the um, documentary. And, and the first one is this is from art. And I quote, I am an artist. I have to be an artist, good or bad, unquote. It seems to me that sums up the lives of many artists who are compelled to create art. Is that the case during art's life also, Suzanne and Jen? Oh yeah. Actually, <laughs> that statement, it's so sweet. Um, that was the first interview we did with art and he was very enthusiastic that was a good day. So right on the roll of the camera, and he came on to say, you know, I'm an artist, I have to be an artist, good or bad. And that is really, as you said, a good summary uh, of his entire creative life. And he did create from the beginning all the way to his early 90s. Wow. Did we mention where this film can be seen on Amazon Prime? What, yes, in fact, that we're going to give Jean and you a chance to help promote the film before we conclude here today. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's in the event description as well. Oh. We have the link to MoraQuest and then the links to where you can view the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And there was there was one other quote I'd like you to comment on, and that is, and I quote. Life is such a long time for such a short stay, unquote. <laughs> is, is there anything you'd like to say about that, Suzanne, to per, help personalize that more for us? 
there are so many of these just odd little things that would pop out of his mind and he'd write onto his drawings or, or write in his sketchbooks. So many, and they, they came from nowhere and they were unlike anybody else's writing that I have ever read. Just whimsical and philosophical at the same time, deep, but, you know, lighthearted. And uh, I just love these. And, you know, what? like I said, with that book that he wrote about illness and death, I... I put a lot of those in there, but I used to sometimes say, oh my God, this is so good. I'm supposed to be the writer in the family. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't very <laughs> He was a better artist, um, such a good artist. And, and just drew and drew, and I couldn't get him to um, take his work to galleries or call publishers. And finally, you know, I think it was 90, I said, art. Do you realize if you die and all these drawings and writings are just scattered about, um, uh, it'll just break my heart because I won't be able to do anything with them then. And when I put it that way, then he stopped being so reticent. He let me show his work to people. He let me sort it and organize it and, uh, and sorting it you know, is when I discovered these drawings about illness and death and all and sat there. And I, I would do it in the middle of the night <clears throat> so he wouldn't say, don't touch that, don't touch that, don't, you know, oh, leave that alone. So I just do it in the middle of the night. And I was sitting there and realized he was just confiding all this, never complaining, confiding it to his uh, sketchbooks. And it, we we're being interviewed in the film and I said, I started describing this and I said, I, I just sat down and cried. And I came over and said, oh, I love you, babe. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, what a memento to have, you know, this document of such a beautiful person no. uh, and him saying that. So I'm so grateful to Jen that she made this movie. Very lovely. It's a, it's a wonderful experience for me. Actually, earlier we talked about new discoveries. That is part of the discovery about all these uh, writings. And so it's halfway through doing the film when I have seen so many of them. Some are on little sticky pads and some are on the side of a drawing. And I realized that this illustrates so much of art thinking. So that's why later on I used his writing as a title card for each segment of the film. And like, you know, it started with, there's no better time than time spent wondering. You know, it's like, you think about that. There is so much meaning um, in that. And so that's how later on I organized the film with uh, each segment of uh, a statement from him. It, it's wonderful. Oh. Uh, Suzanne, did art include writings or sayings on his artwork throughout his career or did that did that come in a phase or was that a continuum? He did it more and more. You know, he he started, I think, like in the 60s, he started writing little things and then it just continued. And, and then sometimes he would just fill pages with just writing, you no know, drawing, but usually they were linked in, in very funny ways. Oh, I... Um, I have a question, and was Art ever approached to do set design for any from any of the theater companies in Chicago? No, he always wanted to do film titles, though. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and I, he did, I think, one didn't, didn't work out. I think, I don't know if the film didn't get made or what. And there was another, he did the film titles, and then they, they, uh, they did it differently, but they used his idea. But Art did design quite a few film uh, festival posters for the Chicago oh. International Film Festival. Oh, yes. Yes, he loved that. He, he, he did wonderful posters. That was more design, but he also would use illustration. Wow. Um, are there any... Uh, are there any public displays of Art's work currently on view in Chicago, or is that is that something that happens in exhibits as they come? 
Well, he's had some exhibits, especially in his last years after he finally let me sort his work, so that could happen. Um, he had some wonderful ones um, at the gallery. Uh, what was it called? One After 909, which is closed now. Um, he had a couple. And at the Cultural Center, there, there was one, um, I think it was in the 80s. Uh, here and there, the oh, Ukraine Museum also did one. Who? The Ukraine Museum in Chicago. Oh yeah! Oh, a huge, uh, wonderful, like kind of, uh, you know, almost his whole life. Uh, the Ukrainian Museum uh, of Modern Art, and and then of course Cards Against, Against Humanity. They did a wonderful whimsical ex exhibit. So they'll be having one in the spring at the Evanston um, Cultural Center, an art center. Oh, that's uh, great. We were about to put it up when the pandemic came and uh, we had to decide. And so I decided to do that. And these are and also, also the Kota Gallery in California, they did oh, a yes. huge exhibition of the head series. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was wonderful. Yeah, Kota in Palm Springs. Palm or? Desert. Palm Desert, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but the ones that will be at the Evanston Center are all uh, prints of his drawings that, that had um, writing on them. In a, in a sort of project or category that he called uh, talking sketchbook. And so there's sort of like captions, but not really, just odd, you know, little things written on. That's wonderful. Well, I, I just have one or two more questions before I turn it back over to Jeanette. But uh, Suzanne, can you tell us something about your collaboration with Art on the design of the poster that commemorated the 40th anniversary of the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima. Oh, yes. Well, he was wondering about, you know, what to do. And I said, oh, you could say, war kills the sun. <laughs> and he liked it. And then we thought about what would, it, what would it look like? You know, if the sun is dead, the sun is gone, everything would be black, there would be nothingness. And he thought to make this blue, one blue line, a, one blue line uh, circle, or, you know, like a sphere. And that was all, you know, against a black background. And we collaborated on various things, never like in a, in a um, organized way. We never sat down and said, oh, let's do this. That it just would happen somehow. But now I feel like I'm collaborating. <clears throat> when I take one or another of his various projects, and, and kind of um, compose it as a book, you know, and add either the writings that went with those drawings or others that suit them, um, really feel his presence. And uh, I certainly learned a lot as a designer from him. So it's like collaborating, even though he's gone, strangely. And uh, Jan, my final question to you before I turn it over to Jeanette is, how did you how did you select art as a subject, um, and how long did you work how long did you work on the project to the finished film that we can see today? Mm. You know, as I mentioned earlier, art um, I got to know art more than ten years, and he always impressed me. And he has, you know, he did so much, and yet he was so humble and he was always stand behind the scene, you know, that compelled me to say, you know, he deserved to be better known and doing a documentary film is my way of presenting him to the public to let people know more about what art had done, you know, in the culture, uh, in the graphic design world. And I followed him for four years to make the film. And I wish if I started earlier, you know, his mind was more intact. He was having, you know, an onset of dementia. 
So I probably would have a lot more interesting story because he would remember them and talk about them. And then, you know, his mental stage is not as he used to be. So it drifted off. So I couldn't have coherent materials. But I'm happy, you know, to have enough to present art as I did in the film. And I was extremely happy that art was able to see a rough cut of the film before he passed away. And so, and he liked it. And that meant so much to me. Thank you. Well, I'm going to turn this over to Jeanette. But before I do, I just want to say to Jan and Suzanne, it's such a pleasure to see you both again. I wish we could be in person. We're here virtually. Suzanne, I don't know if you recall, but I met you and Art several years ago at a program here at the Harold Washington Library Center in person. I'm glad I was able to do that. I look forward to seeing both you and Jean, who I've hosted on numerous occasions, in person at another upcoming event. I hope so. And we hope it's sooner rather than later. So thank it you both for a marvelous evening. And I'm going to give it back to Jeanette so she can wrap up our program tonight. Yes, and, and we're going to pivot. I think that's a new word for 2021. We will pivot. <laughs> and we're going to be asking uh, Jen and Suzanne a couple questions about uh, their role as producers or contributors. And then also a little bit about the persons behind the film. So for Jen, uh, what drew you to writing and then to film production? Well, the writing is sort of uh, something compiled from inside. You know, I wrote Mulberry Child um, mm -hmm. because I was raising an uh, American daughter in the U.S. who is Chinese, but he's, she's, she was more American than American. So when I couldn't communicate with her when she was younger, I wrote our family story, my growing up in China, so she wouldn't forget where she came from. That, you know, compelled me into writing. And of course, I uh, write the script with my producer together for the Art Paul film. It's another, you know, form of writing which uh, um, give me an opportunity really to learn so much about American culture that I didn't grow up in. Uh, so that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And which do you feel more comfortable with, writing or film production? <laughs> they are so different, you know. Um, in, I, I, I was, as I said earlier, I was the associated producer for Mulberry Child, and then I appeared as myself since it's my life story. And then doing the Art Paul film is my first full plunge into managing the whole production, which was wonderful. But, it, you know, filmmaking is really a collective um, art project. You know, I have a producer, I have a wonderful creative editor, and Susan mentioned Paul Chen, my uh, DP, uh, was also wonderful. We worked together. Um, mm -hmm. Writing is very much an individual um, endeavor, and uh, I enjoy both. They will just have such a different endeavor. Uh, like right now, during the pandemic, I feel very lucky I get locked down here and I plunge into another book project, which, you know, give me the outdate, occupied me, get me busy. And it was a, a wonderful um, project to work on when you cannot work with others during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so I feel very fortunate that I, I, I have all these means of arti artistic, creative, you know, uh, project to work on. And the editing, um, is it difficult to self-edit? Um, no, I had a wonderful professional editor. Uh, he was very, very creative, very fast. And whatever ideas, you know, we put together, um, we, we did all the editing actually, not sitting together in the same room. He worked in his own studio. We share the screen, we talk, and then he would retouch really up, and that's how um, we worked through the project. It was a wonderful collaboration. Any interest in writing fiction? 
Uh, that is interesting. Actually, right now I'm working on another nonfiction project. Mm -hmm. um, book project and actually Susan has been my first editor. We were working together. We have a Zoom session every week going through my writing. And I am actually thinking um, probably moving forward, I'll uh, give it a try to fiction writing. Okay. And Suzanne, what initial experience in this art form gave you validation? And I'm talking about you as a photographer. What gave you validation that this field is one that suited you? Well, I, I always liked photography, but I mm -hmm. had planned to be a painter, as mm -hmm. all young people think, you know, artist painting. And then I was drawn to it more and more. And then when I graduated and had a kid to support, uh, photography and photo illustration seemed a lot wiser choice. Mm -hmm. And then the more I did photography, the more I did photojournalism, the more I did photojournalism, the more I did journalism, the more I did writing, and went back to get my master's and started writing more academic things. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's just, just writing and forgetting about photography, except that lately, um, well, then I, then I started doing playwriting and that became my obsession. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, that's the rest of my life, maybe playwriting. Um, but looking out my windows, I live in a high rise and looking out my windows, I just kind of got back into photography um, because the view was sort of my only companion. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do you relate to your view and what you see, all the things you see? And it became something else. I mean, I've lived here for, you know, close to 50 years and yet hadn't seen the kind of things that I'm seeing now and uh, recording in a different way, but writing with it. So it's sort of like a photo journal of the pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. looking out and it's really fun when window washers come by. <laughs> That's, you know, then I get people in my pictures, but. And perhaps you can share with us, what was the first camera you ever owned? And when did you own it? One of those, uh, what do they call them? Those kind of rectangular with the box that opens at the top. The brownie? No, no. no. Uh, something poured. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> then, then, then I had Nikon's, and then uh, the shop where I went, they said, Suzanne, Suzanne, this is new camera. It's really lightweight. Um, what was it called? And do you prefer, um, or do you ever use a camera that has just the roll now, the 35 millimeter roll that you have to physically put in the camera? Or do you prefer more of a digitalized uh, type of a camera equipment? Well, I, I clung to, to film like mm -hmm. most photographers did. I mean, I was reticent about digital. Clung to film, I really loved film, but now, of course, you can play, you can edit mm -hmm. right away with digital. Oh, it's that's thrilling. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a convert. But with and, film, um, I film, I remember on our honeymoon, yeah. I, I, I was photographing yet another cathedral and I said, how many rolls of film have you taken already? <laughs> already? I said, oh, I think 36 or so or 40. Or, he said, okay. We're going to get a divorce on our honeymoon if you don't stop. <laughs> of course, he didn't mean it, but. And the type of photography, do you prefer black and white or color? Oh, I like them both for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's all relative. I mean, you do what, you do what the subject requires. Mm -hmm. And if it was a person, would you prefer doing it in, in black and white or color? I, I like them both. Both, both you there's like more, them. Yeah. There's more in color to manipulate. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Black and white is dramatic. Yes, uh, very so much so. Yeah. Depending, but now I, now I, I don't think I'll ever go back to just pure photography. Yeah. I'm more of a writer, and I realize I should have mm -hmm. been all along. 
Uh, and the results of each, which do you find uh, when more gratifying once you've gone away from a project for a few years or you've just completed it? I, I find writing more gratifying because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like I really have things I feel need saying. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like when the Blues Brothers in the movie, the Blues Brothers say we're on a mission from God. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a mission. I got to do it. But the and, the, and we're, we're going to talk a, a little bit about the future. Mm -hmm. What are your plans for the future? Not just a project, but perhaps is there something in life that you've always wanted to try a field outside of the field of art? Or is there anything that interests you that that you have uh, spoken with a, a person or written about something that said, hey, you know what? Maybe that's something in the future that I would like to pursue. I, I've started so many projects that I haven't finished. That's <laughs> all I want for the rest of my life is to finish projects. <laughs> okay. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. and, and Jen, what about you? Projects for the future? Anything that you haven't tried? We all, uh, I know about your swimming in the lake. Oh, I did and, yes, swimming. Yes, and God save you because, yeah, I, I told her one time, I said, when I think of her, or I think of Jen, one word comes to my mind, fearless. Because <laughs> anybody that swims in the lake, uh, uh, you know, God must be watching over you. But is there anything else that is really something that... You've done film, you've done writing, you've done quite a bit in your life, but is there anything else that you, well, it's piquing your interest and think maybe this is something I would like to try. You know, it's interesting. Um, I like to push boundaries. So mm -hmm. each project you pick on, you know, it's the new learning, just like the pandemic turned me to be a winter swimmer. And I never mm -hmm. thought I could, you know, I swim in the lake every summer, but never went beyond late October. Mm -hmm. And now I learned I do have much more endurance for the cold than I thought I would. I wear a wetsuit, but today, you know, I have sloshes of ice cubes in the water and I'm swimming with the ice together. And afterwards, it's wonderful. It's so energizing. Yeah. Um, like the last couple of years, um, I traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. I trekked in Nepal, went through, I never trekked before. And the first long trekking I did is to Annapurna Circuit. I didn't know the peak is the same as um, Everest Base Camp. So the high mm -hmm. elevation and the trekking, um, the magnitude of nature just mesmerized me. And um, I endured the high attitude and mm -hmm. loved the scenery. And then later on, I went to Japan and hiked the uh, 88 Temple pilgrimage route. Mm -hmm. And I trekked with a backpack by myself for 50 days. That opened my mind so much about Japan and Japanese people. I'm a Chinese. I had a lot of uh, prejudice against Japan and Japanese people. And that trip, the people I met, the experience I had mm -hmm. totally changed my view. And I was touched to the core. And so now I'm writing about all these tracking experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, moving forward, I probably would like to travel more, to see mm -hmm. more of the world and explore and find new interests and write about them. And for both of you um, having uh, children, what is your biggest lesson you've learned from one of your children? <laughs> well, if I could say, you know, if you, anybody have watched my other child, <laughs> they could see, you know, my conflict with my daughter Lisa when she was growing up, you know, the, the generational gap, the culture gap. Um, but now um, she has moved to Europe for working there for seven years. And she was the true, what I call her, a global citizen. She is 35 now. She has traveled to more than 75 countries in the world on her own time. 
And so now it's the reverse side. I think she introduced me to trekking. We trekked the Annapurna circuit in Nepal together. Mm -hmm. And I was just so thrilled to see her mature and growing. And now I'm learning more from her than I probably could, you know, give her. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just wonderful to see um, your child growing up and uh, you know, achieved more than you have ever expected. So that was um, a very much a thrill for me to see her growing. And Suzanne, any any um, anything that comes to mind right away? Well, I, I think that watching a child mature, watching them grow and develop is just such a thrilling thing. I, I always love that. And my daughter, uh, she wanted to be so many different things. Um, and uh, we were once talking about, you know, what things mother always said. I said, gee, did I ever say, you know, what did I say as a mother? And she said, oh, mom, you know, I said, never buy the whole package, which is my way of saying question authority. Mm -hmm. And she did. And she's just gone her own way entirely. And now she's a hospice chaplain and uh Really loving that, dedicated to that, and uh, so that that is such a thrill to to watch people see the kind of things they do when they're little that give you a clue as to what you know they'll do. Mm -hmm. uh, my my grandson is a computer genius, um, and he he liked to take like business cards and staple them together and make things that went down the hall and into the next room. And, and I thought, well, those were like bits, computer bits. He was like thinking along those lines. Mm -hmm. and, and my granddaughter, I, I was so surprised when she decided she wanted to be a doctor. And so she's studying to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. It's like, I always thought she'd be some kind of athlete. She loved to jump and run and make up tricks to do and you know she I thought she'd be like Jen <laughs> swimming in the ice <laughs> but, uh, uh, oh I have to say uh, Jen's book that she's writing now on all this trekking and all this travel and you know trying to uh, trying to heal from her husband's death and also you know bond with her daughter and and see the world which she wanted to do uh, it's it's like you know the book Eat, Pray, Love, which was such a hit. Oh my God, this is so much better. <laughs> oh, thank you, Susan. I can't wait for it to come out. And uh, everyone will have to memorize her name because she doesn't have a title yet. But it's it's so exciting to, to help her edit and uh, get to see it beforehand. Well, it's been a delight. It's, with Jen, it's, it's homecoming. And with you, Suzanne, I have met somebody that I am so happy to have uh, spoken with you and uh, your insights into your husband and, and your profession um, have given me the impetus that per perhaps I should reevaluate some things in my life and move forward with them. <laughs> and I want to thank both of you. The film, the documentary is superb. I encourage everyone uh, please to show it and uh, once it does become available for us to check out we will have it in the library for check for checkout for our patrons but um, on behalf of uh, my uh, uh, humility in watching this film because I've learned so much I want to really thank both of you for producing it and showing us uh, a, a truly uh, Renaissance man. And I'm sure Craig has um, uh, something equal, wonderful to say about the film and, and a thank you too. Yes, let me just say it, it's been a marvelous experience with both Yujan and Suzanne tonight. It's really been wonderful. And I do look forward to the day we can meet again in person. Jan, you must promise to come and do a live in-person program when your next book is published. Mm -hmm. And Suzanne, we'll have you as a special guest that evening uh, as a collaborator with her as an editor on the same evening. I'll put you both on stage if you like. 
Yes. And uh, Jen, please remind our viewers where they can access the film. All right. Well, thank you. It has always, always been a pleasure uh, working with you guys. And the art Paul of Playboy, the man behind the bunny, that's uh, the documentary film on art Paul's life and achievement. That is available on Amazon Prime. It's also available on Google Play, uh, YouTube channel. Um, so there are different venues uh, digitally available um, online and hope um, the library patrons can get a chance to watch them. Um, it's uh, Paul was just a wonderful person. Thank you. Well, thank and, you. Yeah, let me remind our viewers also that we do an extensive series of literary, cultural, and civic programs such as this. You can find out about those at chicagopubliclibrary.org. You can also research more of what Jean Ping has done and what Art Paul is known for by accessing the Chicago Public Library website and its databases. So, so again, thanks to our special guests, Jean Ping and Sue Van Reed. And Jeanette, you've been wonderful putting this together. And thanks to our technical and marketing crews who have also helped promote and get us to this point this evening.